designing for emergent performances. This is supposed to be a historical, personal, and analytical account of what I see going on in design research and also design in general in society, some kind of cultural historical changes that are shaping design towards what I call emergent performances. So what I aim in this presentation is to, is to expand current understandings of design as a product feature, as something intrinsic of objects, things in the world, like this AirPod uh, package. But design is not just um, the industrial activity that produces that uh, AirPod package. Design is not just a professional activity that design that um, uh, relationship between hearing and sound and music, which is also influential to other um, competitive competitors uh, designs. Design, as I understand it, as I'm trying to conceive through these concepts of emergent performances, is a historic making activity, a human activity that projects designable objects into the past and into the future. So to get into emergent performances as a design object, first of all, I need to rethink what design is because it doesn't currently fit uh, understandings of design that reduces it to professional, industrial, or product issue. So as I see, designable objects, they change because they are historical through and through. So design produces things in particular situations that are historically situated, not just in a certain place or culture, but also in a certain history. And they change because they play a role in major cultural historical changes. That's why they are historical through and through. Uh, being in history and, and transforming history or being in history, that's the raison d'etre, the reason why they exist, these objects that are designed. They have a purpose. For example, if you look at this picture, you may wonder if you have never engaged with this activity, what this person is doing. And this person is a typesetter and he was in the 1950s using those tools available to compose um, a page layout that was going to be mass produced uh, using printing press techniques. So the typesetter was doing something that today is currently owned by graphic designers and many typesetters, they lost their jobs. They, there's no such a role for typesetter nowadays that once the printing press is, has become automated and especially after desktop publishing became available. Or, or in other words, designing the computer and producing in a uh, electronic printer uh, smoothly. There was no need for this middleman, but this middleman was also someone who added skill to typography and to uh, page composition layout was much more careful at that time. And this object of design is not visible for us now since all of these uh, re technology replacements and, and job uh, uh, replacements have, uh, have got affected the industry. But there was a design object that at that time that was so clear what was being designed, the page layout. And in the 1980s, some Scandinavian uh, participatory designers, they uh, tried to tackle this transition in a more humane way instead of designing uh, page composition digital desktop uh, uh, publishing systems that would uh, make this make this typesetter um, skills outdated. They uh, brought in this uh, typesetting um, knowledge so that it could be expressed through a graphic uh, uh, user interfaces it was one of the first uh, desktop publishing graphic user interface uh, ever in history. They made some quite some interesting progresses. Some of the ideas of this Utopia project and the Tips um, software uh, were incorporated and featured subsequent uh, software packages like Adobe InDesign or Adobe Photoshop. So this is kind of a, a grandpa or grandma uh, of this uh, of Photoshop in modern. Uh, media management manipulation and desktop publishing applications. And in the 90s, something was uh, different happening. Design started to become more like a glue between different disciplines. And over here, you see a picture of ideal uh, multidisciplinary designers working a project, and you don't see 
the object that they are designing so clearly, differently from the previous screens where you could see a little bit of the page layout mark on the, the screen or the visualization of the, uh, the tool provided. Over here, you don't see clearly. There are many different images, and most of them are not about the object itself, the product. It's mostly about the context around the product that these different disciplinary uh, experts, they are trying to, uh, to grasp. So there's something going on in the 90s when design is expanded beyond product design, industrial design, or from, in the case of computer graphics, from the interface itself towards experience, towards interactions, towards something uh, bigger. And nowadays it's much more consolidated. Uh, we even have names to talk about this, not something that was not so much available in the 90s. Nowadays, UX writers, developers, designers, they may even have their own, that have a shared platform where they design together or they co-design uh, these experiences, this process, the workflow together with the, uh, the graphic representation of it in different levels of abstraction, more structural representations, more uh, visual, uh, high fidelity representations. What, what's going on right now is that this experience or interaction or even service objects, they have become more commodified, more tangible to the eye, so you can see what's going on. But in all of these examples, we are seeing this emergence of new objects of design, and sometimes they are more tangible, so that some other, other times they are less tangible, but that's not the basic nature to be tangible or intangible. It's so much about um, the kind of tools and concepts and theories we use to grasp them. As much as we get a better sense of it, then it becomes tangible. And designers, they are mostly um, busy with uh, how to design these objects because they have um, professional demands for this. However, sometimes they reflect and wonder why this or that object has become designable. And there is this recent the Expanding Scope of Design report produced by Other Tomorrows and Swiss Next. And they, it's based on a survey of interviewing several uh, designers, mostly based in Europe or in the United States, some in Australia, but generally a global north perspective, what, what's current, the current state of design, where design is heading towards. And they find out, yes, design is expanding definitely. The object of what we are dealing now has to uh, deal with issues like technology, gender, race, power, politics, culture, climate, economics, so many different new issues that would not be covered by the traditional graphic or industrial design scope. But while trying to explain why this is happening, what is the, the pressures, they come up with this responsive and anticipatory um, new characteristics of design, but this is mostly what are the demands, not exactly what are the social forces um, pressing design to become more concerned about these issues. As an academic, I can tell, wow, that's, in academia, we have a much more uh, a slower process of identifying what are these uh, forces and explaining why these changes are happening. My thesis from 2015, I tried to provide a general theory of our design objects expansion. And I have to say, it was quite sketchy at that time. I didn't have a complete full picture of what was going on in the field. Now, almost 10 years has passed since I published that thesis, defended it successfully at the University of Twente, and I uh, went on to move to other universities and different countries and experiencing design in different ways with different uh, students and professionals. And now I, I have uh, some new updates that I would like to append to the, the initial ideas. That's the purpose of this uh, lecture. And over there, I described how the object of design historically expanded from construction materials to emerging performances due to contradictions in design activity. So my general theory is that uh, once the contradictions in design activity are unbearable, then design can pushes its objects to become something else. And that those tensions, they don't come from design activity itself, but comes from a network of different design activities. I cannot go so much into the details now. I just want to let you know, in a nutshell, that this has going on for the last 200 years. And the emergent performance, which is my focus now, has just um, emerged or became uh, perceivable 
around the 90s. And the uh, past example I showed to you was that this IDEO multidisciplinary design team trying to figure out something they were designing that was not about the industrial product, although there was uh, a product that embodied uh, this sense of experience and interaction they tried to push forth in the project. And so as professional and academic activity design is always trying to catch up with this expanding object and most of these formulations, theorizations, even my own theory is a bit lagging behind. <laughs> What's going on in society is much more interesting than what we are talking about, although talking about it is very important for us to uh, spearhead what's next. I mean, what are we going to do next and how are we going to cope with that uh, uh, expansion in a practical matters. And uh, visualizing that in a much, much simpler way, using terms currently adopted in industry, in the 1980s we were still under the realm of complex entity as being the most important design object, and industrial design, graphic design were uh, the main disciplines in design that uh, dealt with this object. Uh, however, since the 90s, this expansion has created opportunities for new disciplines. Sometimes they emerge in industry, sometimes they emerge uh, in academia, like UX design or UX experience design, interaction design, service design, product design, sustainable design, information design. If you pay careful attention, you will see that all of those new disciplines that started to consolidate after the 1990s, they have this um, undefined or intangible or fuzzy object of design. So what uh, design? What is an interaction? What is a service? What is a sustainable? What is information? And when, when I talk about product design here, that's probably the most biggest contradiction in this, in this list because I'm not talking about industrial design. I'm not talking about uh, industrial product. I'm talking about a software mostly product, a software that is marketed as a product which is a bit weird and, and it, it helps us to understand that nowadays this new object that is emerging, that which I call emerging performance, it is all about uh, the time dimension and how things organize and, and take shape and take form uh, through time, not through space like it was industrial and graphic design. And that has a profound uh, effect on the way how professionals position themselves into the world. Uh, whereas in the past, in the complex entity object, the designer doer would sit down in front of the computer and the computer would or represent the object in a way that he could manipulate it, I don't know, through a 3D uh, modeling software or through Adobe Photoshop. And, and everything that would come out of it would be considered products, either physical, product, a print product, even digital product. And the target was to uh, change or to uh, the user's behavior or to provide some needs for users, but users had a more passive role than now they do. Actually, uh, in the in face of the emergent performance, users, they become new designers, they become co-designers, they join designers either synchronously in a meeting or a workshop or asynchronously when the uh, source code of that design is available for them to tweak and change and hack and transform into something else. So modular systems, they have these characteristics where the user plays a much important role in creating the experience and the interaction. Therefore, I prefer not to call them users anymore. I prefer to call them designers, a hybrid between a user and a designer. And what is being designed by designers or design thinkers, as I like to contrast with design doers, are services. And services may have some product as avatars, as touch points, but the main process is targeted at uh, uh, systems or uh, infrastructures or networks or many, many things organized and uh, coherently connected so that this experience and interaction can flow through this process. In a, in a much more human way. So there's a lot of more um, uh, post-industrial activity of co mass customization, of um, co-creation of value, and many other things that are not just discussed in service design, but also experience design and other fields that I mentioned before. So this is a definitely something that's coming from industry. Uh, in academia, we are thinking about that in a more um, forward thinking. So instead of uh, saying, hey, uh, everything is going on now is 
working toward design is moving towards service design, or is moving towards interaction design, it's moving towards experience design. In academia, we try to make sense of things in a more fundamental and essential way so that we don't get um, dragged by these um, uh, hypes or these uh, buzzwords that um, all of a sudden are replaced by another one. We try to see things that are more constant and, and they will uh, remain with us more for a longer time so that we don't spend care, uh, very important um, public resources on doing research on something that will not last for long. So I, what I call immersion performance tries to grasp all of these different new objects into one. And, and, and the characteristic most important, the difference between past design objects and this one is that it is shared with users. So the merger performance is a performance that the designers can join. Because in the past, designers would design the object and they would deliver the object, the complex entity to uh, users or to citizens or to whoever they targeted. But an emergence performance cannot be delivered, it has to be enacted and every time the performance happens, it happens in a different way. Because performance is a process, not a product. And it is intangible but it can be measured and it can be planned but it's an emergence nonetheless. So you cannot completely bound the emerging performance into something that you can control. And I tried to convey those findings in the realm of hospital healthcare design, where I was working my PhD thesis research, and I made it um, in a fun way through a, a board game called the Expensive Hospital. This uh, board game is a semi-cooperative board game on designing a mid-emergency, and you you have to uh, grow this hospital while the patient queue is changing all the time, so you don't know exactly what is the demand. And some new emerging patients they may come in, and you have to build so quickly the hospital to uh, meet those demands. And sometimes you make decisions either to admit patients or to send them to the, to forward them to another hospital. It's a very challenging game. It's also very competitive because each player has a different way of earning money. They are competing to uh, win and uh, have the best have the most uh, to become the richest player. However, the, the, if they do too um, individualistic, the, the hospital would go bankrupt because they need to, to establish a, a minimal amount of shared interests so that the hospital gets a, a sensitive design. If everyone is thinking individually on their own, for their own interests, the multidisciplinary experts involved in designing a hospital the hospital go ban goes bankrupt because the design simply does not work. There's some need of balancing this contradiction between personal gain and collective gain. And, and, and this is at the heart of uh, managing a healthcare activity, um, just talking about um, real estate development, but this could also be translated to many other healthcare activities. For example, I run a, a, a subsequent uh, cross-cultural validation uh, research in, in, a hospital, in, a, in a university hospital in Brazil after I came back from the Netherlands when I defended my PhD thesis and I checked whether the um, basic claims or structures that I found and incorporated to the board game, Hispanic Hospital, were they also valid for the culture and history of Brazil and the specific cultural history of healthcare activity there. And yeah, for my surprise, I discovered that I nailed it. And it's these uh, healthcare professionals there in Brazil in 2016, they were facing almost the same kind of contradictions that healthcare professionals in the Netherlands were facing. And after they played the game and became sensitized that they needed to collaborate despite the differences and contradictions that they were facing, then we uh, opened up the possibility for playing uh, more open-ended games that enabled them to address more concrete, uh, uh, specific issues that they were facing. I mean, the, hosp the expensive hospitals are like a sensitizing activity where you see the, its own contradictions as related to your contradictions, but when you want to address the contradictions of your organization, then you need game-storming activities like the empathy map, like the, the, um, uh, the collaborative planning view and uh, a, a rather priority radar and uh, scenario planning and the, the, um, the changing darts. I mean, we created many, we created and we drew from the pool of uh, exciting 
game storming activities, what was necessary to deal with the contradictions that they were uh, identifying in the work. And the result was great. In a few months, we managed to overcome some uh, conflicts that uh, disabled communication among the teams because of some resentments. And we found a way of transforming those conflicts into a, um, an everyday activity that has to be managed and transformed into a possibility for innovating. So conflict um, was reframed as something potentially positive if managed well by uh, the teams involved. And that became the foundational um, concept behind what they called planning for change or planning for emergence. So the initial idea before the intervention was that planning was specifying everything beforehand in a very bureaucratic way and everyone would only need to execute the planning. But while going through this process of playing those games, they realized, healthcare practitioners realized that they need to have flexible planning because emergencies were so important in their business that they could not simply uh, adhere to the rules if the rules were no longer relevant for the specific uh, issues that they were facing. And the rules had to be more abstract and uh, vague, otherwise they would be uh, overly structuring their activity. That profound uh, reflection was also seen in other organizations. So after I worked with this hospital, I moved to a, an utility company a few years later, and that utility company were not in the business of healthcare, but still they face similar contradictions and the approach of um, uh, doing designing for emergency or planning for emergency beforehand. That's how I started. But then we discovered that it was not just so much about planning, but designing strategies, tactics, uh, interfaces, processes, many things that are better conveyed through the concept of designing than planning. And designing it is uh, further away from the concept of control than planning currently is, at least in the Brazilian uh, context. So we explore many different ways of grasping and representing a contradiction and we convey this to the public, to the general public in this project using an animation. So the contradictions that this utility company was facing was uh, publicly shared using those animations um, so that um, and young entrepreneurs will get interested on in working with this utility company and join their uh, larger effort on creating a smart grid so that they, instead of having one single big for, uh, energy production and distribution company, which was this utility company, they wanted to, de uh, to decentralize the energy production activity to have a smart grid make many different smaller companies uh, producing or distributing energy in different ways. And then the concept of designing for emergency started to consolidate. It means uh, affording many possibilities in a design space, including the unexpected and the impossible, things that people don't think are even part of the scope of that design space. And therefore, I, this concept of emergent performance is pretty much um, called emergence, emergent because it provides uh, surprising outcomes. So there's outcome one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but then there is this thing that came out of that shared object, the object that new designers are also designing, for example, service, something completely new comes out, for example, a more collaborative way of uh, uh, delivering that service or co-creating that service. And that's something that can become a social innovation, that can become something, a new business, a spin-off, we don't know. But exactly because we don't know, but we're still interested on in hosting or holding that activity, uh, that's why I call it emergent performance. And, and of course, we can see this kind of um, uh, emergency from uh, complexity. Remember that I mentioned that in the past, the object of design was this complex entity, and once the a uh, complex object was delivered to the world, even if they were not you in use, it was already considered to be done. But an emergent performance is only uh, fulfilled once you actually see it happen in the world. And from that complexity emerge further complexity, these unexpected outcomes. Pretty much like as you see these birds flock, trying to um, uh, center their energy in different ways and 
and, and rehearse this collective uh, flight that they're going to undertake towards the south before they do these migratory uh, flights. And, and it's very interesting to see how they experiment with different shapes for their flock and there's not a single bird taking control, um, designing the whole um, uh, swarm. Each bird designs a very small part of the whole thing by following some uncertain predictable rules. Uh, this has been uh, noticed in the 1980s by Craig Reynolds, a uh, um, computer scientist. He created um, an electronic version of bird flocks called the Boyd, or the Bird Oids, or Bird Androids. It has become a very influential visualization uh, that sparked my own um, uh, interest on designing for emergent performances. And I was looking at this video many, many times and seeing how the the, the, the the overall intelligence that these birds display, these boids display, it's not coming from an overall view, an over plan. It's coming from each bird uh, um, uh, executing a very small set of simple rules. And I have been trying to emulate, to simulate this kind of birdoids or boid experiment with my interaction design students at uh, Capital University of Paraná. That was about 2018. So we, they are following the rules, basic rules that those birds they follow. And as you can see, the pattern of their movements they, they seem so similar to what the, the the boys were doing. And they were experimenting that to understand that this following rules and and changing the rules, as I just did now, task for um, pushing, setting aside the, uh, the obstacles, it changes the interactions between them. So they would understand that interaction design was uh, so much about uh, the situation where people are in, where these obstacles come in, but also about this uh, interaction rules or norms or whatever we call this materiality that gives shape to human interactions in a way that we have to rehearse or reenact over and over, like a ritual, a gesture, a pattern. And they learned that interaction design was, of course, not something happening on the screen, but uh, amongst people. And here uh, you see the three basic rules identified by Craig Reynolds in the uh, birds uh, uh, migratory flights uh, that you have seen before. Uh, each bird has to steer to avoid crowding local flock mates, so they would not be too close to each other. They would separate, but not too much, because they would still seek cohesion. Every time you would see um, a hollow space uh, emerging amongst uh, the other birds, uh, the closest birds would try to fill in that hollow bird. And of course, that would generate another hollow behind it, that bird, and that would be filled by another bird. And that's how this movement gets um, distributed through a chain reaction. But they were still beyond these two different rules that are mostly um, talking about entropy and generating kind of random movement, but alignment, they are also in, uh, giving a certain direction to the flock. And, and that alignment is not um, following a leader, it's following the average direction that uh, your flock mates, the, the birds that are closest to you are heading towards. So it's not following one big leader all the time, but following what most people around you are following. So you're basically trying to go with the flow, trying to go where people are going. But since uh, each one of these groups, these flock mates are different, then the whole flock is changing the its direction depending on the kind of um, situation they are in. For example, a new obstacle emerges and then they can quickly, swiftly change and, and go around the, the, the obstacle just because they have these simple rules that can be applied by any bird without having a single centralized uh, intelligence. We have been experimenting, uh, generating designs based on writing simple rules and then asking to implement, execute those simple rules and of course one group of students design the rules, the other group execute, and then later on they compare, and, and the designers, they come, hey, you didn't execute in the way how we wanted. And that's how the surprise comes in, and if they are open-minded, they would see this is a positive 
characteristic of emergent performance is that you discover something new every time it's executed and then you can fit in the process so you can update the script or the rules that you have designed for that game or for that visual um, uh, this condition design um, so that you take an opportunity to take advantage of uh, something new that emerged that might be useful for all the users too. Uh, so emergent performances they cannot be predicted and controlled to be very strict about it to be very uh, precise but they can be prospected and negotiated there's some kind of nuance and the difference between uh, prediction and perfection controlling and negotiating although uh, of course you're interested on uh, on giving intentionality to the design and that's at the core of design design is always an intentional activity you don't design by chance because that's not design design has to do with intention but an intention doesn't need to be um, a single one it can be multiple intentions they can uh, be articulated together that's what negotiation means and I'm going to sh share quickly some pictures of this um, Surreal modular furniture system designed by uh, former students um, Conrado Dembinski and Joan Victor uh, Tahanar Araujo. They were interested on um, open design, free design, or as we call in Brazil, design libre. And they designed this modular system so much that um, furniture owners could change their furniture uh, across their lives. So they would even be able to grow a family around the furniture. That was more, more some of the initial ideas that they had. Later on, they started to expand the context of what they thought about that project. Just because they were using modularity patterns and perimeters, there are simple rules that they can employ for designing for emergency. They, they didn't try to design the whole system from top down. Instead of designing all possible furniture or one single furniture they wanted, they designed the system first. They thought about the basic module, we just saw it um, combining multiple ways, but then later on they started to imagine other objects, other modules that would connect to that basic modular uh, um, uh, generic module. And that's how they started to um, prospect Suru as, as a kind of a, a system of different uh, modules. And they negotiated different kind of connections would enable us to um, assemble different kind of furniture pieces. Once conceived then, the emergent, performance, the emergent performance is already on the move and designers cannot stop it. Uh, so these students, they could not prevent other people from coming and seeing their system and speculating <laughs> different ways of using that they have never anticipated. For example, uh, some students, including myself, <laughs> got interested on prospecting Suru as an improvisation of party system. What if we have a party and, and this party uh, has furniture that you can change in uh, to support uh, emergent activity? Like in this case, uh, we try to rehearse that possibility using early prototypes of the system. And we are thinking about having a party where uh, someone wants to uh, bring in uh, a DJ table uh, with some kind of knobs and different uh, uh, manipulation, music manipulation materials and then they could assemble quickly a, a table with a, with a proper height for this uh, DJ that came in the party. Uh, we, we tried this in using an improvisation theater activity where we didn't know exactly which kind of furniture would be needed but then the activity itself would demand and then we would show what is the most important why do we need to have such kind of uh, modular systems? Because in general, human activities, uh, especially in young people, are becoming more dynamic, so they need to change their environments to suit their activities. And this do, two students start to realize they have to move with the design activity and follow instead of stopping and trying to control. And then they finally realize that Suru could be a portable furniture system that you could bring to new parties or to new services or to any kind of event that would require some kind of adaptable, flexible furniture. And they, they tested it out by going around the city with the, the basic modules on their bikes. And we can learn uh, to design for emergent performances through performance-based arts. I mean, I, I was mentioning dancing, that's definitely 
uh, performance-based arts, but I, I personally got engaged with um, a few other performance arts more in depth, like uh, Capoeira has been very influential on my way of being in the world when I was experiencing some bullying in my uh, high school experience and feeling um, uh, low self-esteem of being a Brazilian, I learned capoeira and capoeira was very important. Capoeira is um, uh, historically very uh, uh, foundational dance uh, and uh, slash martial arts activity in that uh, growing up in Brazil during the colonial times the um, enslaved people from Africa, they were uh, trying to keep their uh, skills, their dance skills, their um, uh, martial arts skills alive while the colonizers or the slave owners uh, would not allow them to do that in, under a kind of explicit uh, activity. They had to hide somehow the martial arts uh, behind some kind of a dance. So capoeira was presented to the Portuguese uh, slave owners as a kind of a dance, but instead it would also exercise in their bodies in a way they would be ready to fight if needed. And capoeira was out loud in Brazil for a while, has been a, a subversive activity that became uh, came back to become an official activity, and nowadays it's recognized as one of the iconic cultural activities um, of Brazil. And here as I am, I'm not as good as I was at that time, still trying to uh, keep the body in shape, but uh, I'm also, I think I, I, I put much more effort into uh, um, another uh, performance-based art called Hindustanic Folk Curtain, also known as Bhajan. And, and uh, here I am with my fellow colleagues at the University of Florida practicing this. So this is still something I practice regularly. And this kind of uh, music, uh, collective music, um, does not have a specific script or um, uh, specific structure that we follow. There is a lot of improvisation going on and each person who joins to listen can also join to sing, to chant and to play instruments and we have to uh, somehow accommodate what each one of us will do but without having a planning and without talking and it's a lot of fun. It's all similar to the experience of jamming in jazz but even with less rules which gets to produce some weird noises sometimes, but it's really interesting. And later on in my life, I got interested into theater of the pressed. And then there was when I realized that those two worlds, design and performance arts, could not be uh, connected in my life. And uh, theater of the pressed has this purpose of a uh, changing the world through theater. So you would actually rehearse reaction to oppression, pretty much like you would uh, redesign something. And then uh, we started to, uh, to experiment using theater of the press and design. I have other uh, papers and talks about this. I'm not going to go too much into the detail. I just want to mention that any of these uh, uh, performance-based arts, they have this common basic movements, recurrent movements, uh, the basic improvisational structure. In the case of capoeira, that's jinga. Jinga is a movement that you go back and forth and you uh, alternate your um, your legs on the ground, the position of them. So you never stand still. You need to be moving all the time uh, in capoeira because if you're moving all the time, you are much better positioned to do the next moves. And all moves in capoeira, they are always responding to your opponent. You never start a movement by itself. You're always responding to a past movement. And of course, there is a seating movement <laughs> Where the uh, capoeira players do once they get into the the roda, which is the the space where they are dancing or uh, fighting, and and as you can see in this picture on the left side, you see jinga uh, um, done as a as a as a, a pathway to a cocorinha, to negativa, to other movements that uh, a player may do if they want to uh, react to the opponent. So. Coming back to Jinga all the time is what makes a capoeira fighter ready to uh, engage into any kind of emergencies, allowing several movements. And it's the beauty of capoeira comes out from the Jinga. And when the performance then is moving towards something you don't want, for example, an opponent is coming to hit you in your face because you're already moving, it's easier for you to keep moving <laughs> instead of starting a new move. So you, you profit from 
uh, uh, the law of um, inertia, right? And we have a better chance to change its direction if you're already on the move. And that's very important for, for a kind of subversive activity. Now, let's get a very concrete example of how we design for emergent performances in a case in a case of something that we don't want to be the way it is. Let's get to the discuss generative AI. I'm going to uh, provide here some criticisms of how generative AI is emerging in the design field, but also some alternative movements that we can do to um, regenerate AI. And generative AI is based on complex, not simple rules that are so difficult to understand and master that most people cannot even understand what's going on when they uh, type a prompt and they get an image and even if the prompt is the same, the image is completely different every time. I myself cannot explain exactly all the details of this, but what I know so far is that uh, this action of generating an image is actually not out of nowhere. Uh, each of these uh, diffusion algorithms, they, uh, they draw on so many other pictures that have been already indexed by some kind of databases and by using those previous images, not in a simple way combining them, not like a collage, it's much more sophisticated, uh, then you get a different image all the time. There's some randomness to it, but it's mostly tied to the way how we give meaning to the words that we type in the prompts. Many people cannot even get to this level of understanding, uh, so uh, people just use it as it was a ready-made uh, product or um, a tool that you just press a button and you get a result and all the time you get something different until you get what you want. That's how many people do prompt engineering and that's reducing design to a complex entity. So a prompt engineer does not design an emergent performance because once the object is there, generated, it stands still fixed. It is complex, the image, and we can look at it and say wow beautiful but you cannot interact with that because it's not emergent performance and in general i see uh, artificial intelligence as a reductive uh, tool or technology that is moving us to lose some cultural richness that we have for so long conquered and achieved collectively so i see as a dangerous by nowadays in the way it's being uh, deployed in our society uh, and then we might lose this grasp of this new emergent performance and recede back to complex entities and maybe in the future even go back to construction materials. For example, if we, uh, that's a big speculation for it, but if we keep consuming energy and other material and natural resources with a pace and the appetite that AI, artificial intelligence requires us, so at some point we might need to go back to think about do we need, still need to make computers out of uh, silicon chips <laughs> because it's not sustainable any longer? And that's how we go back to design as construction materials. However, there are other ways of expanding design uh, towards emergent performances that uh, doesn't require us to reduce what we have gained. If we develop a critical consciousness and we avoid those biases towards reducing our uh, complexity, then we can change it, the, the artificial intelligence, so that it'll proceed and keep us going towards emerging performances still. Um, the problem is that most designers, they think about the how, not so much about the why, these, uh, these design objects that are emerging, and if they need to design something, they will just figure out how to best write prompt engineering <laughs> that has been available in different kind of diffusion uh, stable, uh, stable diffusion algorithms uh, powered software like um, uh, Adobe Firefly. Uh, the problem is that those databases they are uh, pretty biased. If you type color photograph of a politician, you hardly get any people person of color in the results. And it's kind of a racist biasing right into the database. And uh, if designers are not critical about, uh, about this, they will just reproduce the racist structure in society. So it's very important to be aware of this. But uh, to be aware and to counter is not enough. We actually need to expose these contradictions to the public and keep the uh, performative aspect. So instead of just making images, we need to have events 
where people can interact and have discussions and dialogues. And I found in speculative and critical design a very interesting way of uh, uh, promoting debate on uh, new technologies like artificial intelligence. Here's a project by Juliana Saito, a former digital design student from Capital University of Paraná. And she designed a, a, a digital assistant that would help people to become more aware of their procrastination habits stimulated by its own artificial intelligence. Sometimes this uh, artificial, uh, uh, this assistant would uh, discourage the person to um, uh, procrastinate, like um, flipping through a um, uh, Facebook uh, feed. But other times, uh, the assistant would stimulate the person to uh, go back to work. And that kind of uh, affective interface was key to this project and uh, helped us to um, foresee something that nowadays, uh, in some 10 years old project, is commonplace. Uh, the role of assistants in shaping our behavior and trying to change society in general. And that, that project, Juliana wanted to convey that we need to be aware that the systems are not just useful, they're also useless in some ways, and they make us feel useless in face of many activities. So we, we need to be very critical about how we use them in our daily lives. Here's another opportunity much closer to our current situation, 2020. We, run, we hosted this theater forum activity with new design students from USP, uh, Sao Paulo. These students were concerned about the um, new AI, generative AI tools that were becoming available at that time and what would be the impact on um, designers' employability. So we run a um, speculative design theater show uh, that was a, a designer uh, being hired by an artificial intelligence to generate something for a client because this AI was not able to generate on its own something um, uh, worth of value to be sold to a client, real client, and instead of generating using its own database, it has um, it, it, it was exploiting label, cheap label, using some kind of uh, 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 Turk uh, system like Amazon Turk. But this is for design, and designers were being paid so much, so little for actually doing their graphic design work because they were using semi-automated prompt engineering systems. And at some point in this um, show, the designer feels uh, pretty alienated and feels like it has to do something, that person has to do something to change the situation. Uh, this designer, the Lumpa designer tried to organize uh, a strike, but then it's cut off the system. Well, the story goes on and on. But the interesting thing about this uh, speculative design theater is that we try to uh, show designers that Designing is a, a political and economic activity in the world as much as other activities, and it's subjected to the laws of capitalism. And designers need to be aware and critical about this because otherwise their work at some point may be jeopardized. So this, are, this is what I've done on trying to counter generative AI or to bring some more critical consciousness about it. But critical consciousness is not just about stopping something we don't like. It's also about changing the direction of the movement, as I was talking about in capoeira movement. So we want to um, grab what we've got, so we don't want to throw out generative AI, we want just to move towards a new direction. That's what I mean by regenerating AI in a similar way how we can regenerate damaged environments. Let me give you an example from uh, bio uh, marine uh, activity. Uh, geo um, uh, biologists, oceanographers, they use this uh, coral reef restoration frames for many decades. So they put some basic um, uh, structure so that uh, uh, coral reefs, they would be invited to, to join and to grow on top of that structure and avoid this uh, coral reef uh, whitenization, which means dead zones. And, and with that collaboration between human uh, um, lives and, and uh, modern human lives like this, uh, uh, collaboration of trying to build something together, uh, the coral reefs uh, across a few years, they become repopulated and they sometimes even become richer than they were before this and those interventions. So that helps us to think about how we can maybe regenerate AI. Here's uh, 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 a case, a project that I was involved that started many, many years ago when Google Drive became uh, commonplace in the workplace. 
but we were concerned when Google Drive started to be used by social movements, by design uh, studios, and replace um, some face-to-face -face interactions that were so important for people to communicate and make sense of what they were doing. Uh, so we tried to address this lack of having an open source software that would do the same as Google Drive was doing, but with a more uh, transparent and public uh, bent. Because Google Drive was all about having um, security and access restrictions, where for us, uh, working you know, with free software and open source software, open hardware, we really wanted to have an open structure that everyone could uh, uh, follow and maybe participate. And he, that's the story behind Corais platform developed in 2011 as an alternative and also good to mention biomimetic collaborative design pro platform. So we were inspired by this, the, the, the oceanographer's attempt to regenerate uh, coral reefs and the coral reefs themselves, the nature uh, structure that when some um, uh, coral individual dies, its own um, basic structure, let's say the skeleton, it stays and remains available for further uh, coral individuals to um, use as as a as a base uh, foundation of its 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 own being. So every person who every individual who would die in that population would uh, offer something for the future population. So this kind of a legacy uh, perspective was in, ingrained into the design of Corais. So every, every um, collaborative project had to be public, accessible, and readable by anyone on the internet and um, licensed by Creative Commons license only. You could not choose to have private uh, copyright uh, formats for your project precisely because you wanted to stimulate this uh, subsequent uh, activity of people getting inspired by past projects and doing and drawing from them. And we were very successful, more than 700 projects uh, were hosted in this platform. Nowadays it's less active, but it is still ongoing. And I myself engaged to so many different projects in this platform, I learned so much from different things that I didn't expect that like, what is a solidarity economy? Why do we need to print our own money in social currencies? to uh, uh, shield local communities from global capitalism. This is something I learned by engaging to these collaborative projects, and I'm sure that other people got different learnings from this network. This is a visualization of different projects and how people relate to each other. I'm uh, highlighting my own picture there just because you know what is in there. So people connected to other people by collaborative projects, and sometimes you meet people that share different projects that you never have met before. And that's what the uh, definition of an emergent performance is, this kind of behavior that is displayed collectively and is adaptable to different situations. It follows some simple rules, but it has some very interesting complex effects. And we uh, shared uh, uh, our learnings in this book called Coralizando, that has been written by uh, eight different people across Brazil and um, we published it on like an open source uh, common creative commons license so anyone can read and even change the book uh, because we wanted to uh, stimulate more collaboration and solidarity in cultural production that was the focus of that book um, to theorize um, this uh, uh, emerging performance and and to go beyond what i was conceiving by the time i wrote my phd thesis i see it as a shared object that has multiple outcomes, as I mentioned to you before. Uh, but an interesting thing that is now becoming more uh, conscious to me after all of these engagements is that this, sh this emerging performance, they, they let the contradictory forces of society more visible and prone to change for everyone who's sharing that object. So much so that an emerging performance is also a moment where everything can happen, everything can change in society. They are magnificent uh, events that create opportunities for us to transform the foundation structures of society little by little, starting with an organization, but then it's spreading out to other organizations using this networking effects I mentioned before. So designing for emergent performances in a nutshell is designing for change. And with that, I uh, just wanna let you know that it's quite a bit of um, papers that have been published after my PhD thesis that uh, deal with those topics. 
and I hope that it might be useful for someone who wants to uh, dig deeper into this uh, conversation about the future of design object. Thank you very much for watching.